This program is brought to you by Singapore Management University. Hello and welcome to Perspectives, coming to you with a live audience from the Singapore Management University's School of Law. I'm Taymor Nabili. In today's episode, we look into the impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative on Southeast Asia, and we ask, should ASEAN take a more active role? Now, the future of trade and economic development in Asia could depend heavily on what becomes of this initiative. Now, ASEAN members like Indonesia and Malaysia and Thailand have welcomed the initiative, and they're focusing primarily on the economic benefits that they hope it will deliver. But for others, there are still concerns about geopolitical implications and challenges, such as security, financial liability, and the question in many people's minds, does this mean China's about to take over the world? Well, joining me on our panel today to discuss those issues and more, I have James Crabtree, his Associate Fellow of the Asia-Pacific Programme at Chatham House, based in London. Professor Arnaud de Meyer is President of Singapore Management University. Omar Shahzad is Group Chief Executive Officer of Mineheart, and Richard Fenning, who's Chief Executive Officer at Control Risks. Panel, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for being here as well. It's nice to have you along. We're going to hear your questions in a moment, but first I'm going to put a question to you folks uh, so we can set up uh, mm -hmm. the conversation and bring in uh, one contentious issue, and that is, how can ASEAN make sure that it derives optimum outcomes from this Belt and Road Initiative? We've given the audience three options to choose from. ASEAN can have a greater centralized control of its decision-making, coordinated member fund for investment in BRI uh, projects and investments, or a stronger ASEAN secretariat. If any of you think any of those three options would actually help ASEAN's position in engaging with China on the BRI initiative, please enter your, your vote, and we'll come to you in a minute, panel, uh, for your thoughts on this. But let's, uh, let's let the audience have a chance to vote and see if they think much of this. I mean, we've thrown a couple of interesting options in there. ASEAN's own internal structure is obviously always a key for conversation, particularly in this year uh, of Singapore's chairmanship of the thing. So let's have a look at our result. And our, our panel audience seems to think by um, a not insubstantial margin that ASEAN should have a better decision-making structure. Um, and that could mean any manner of evils. So maybe we can start with that at some point. China, in any context, when you talk about China, it always arouses questions of geopolitics, of ideology, um, and it becomes somewhat personal. So I'm going to start with you, Omar, if I might, sure. because you're a businessman who's doing business on the Belt and Road Initiative. I want a pragmatic business perspective on what this means and how it affects real people doing work like you do. Just within ASEAN alone, um, our infrastructure requirements are about $180 billion per annum to meet the sort of growth rate we are projecting over the next few years. We are looking at investing between 5 and 10% of our GDP on infrastructure. China's engagement in this region to support that infrastructure ex initiative, I think in many ways, is very welcome. Um, for companies like us, it allows us to work with Chinese state-owned enterprises and private enterprises to support them on the ground in terms of our expertise, our presence on the ground, both in terms of execution capabilities, services, legal, professional services, and also in terms of undertaking some of that construction work by providing materials or doing some of the construction work jointly or as a subcontractor to Chinese firms. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies based in the region. Do you sense as a business that somehow you're the lesser partner in the engagements you're getting involved in, that perhaps um, you're being used is perhaps not the right word, but perhaps you're the, you're, you're the lesser partner. Well, in, in, in many cases, I think the projects are being announced at a G2G level between the countries in ASEAN and the Chinese government. Then this project gets downloaded to the companies. Companies from China would often take the lead and would work with local companies. I think over time as these projects evolve and as more projects come through, I do see an opportunity for local firms to take over time a bigger proportion of the work. But you are right, Timur. In, in many cases, the lead of this project are these big Chinese companies. There's no question about it. Uh, Richard, from your perspective, uh, in a broader 
broader frame, China as the big brother in the Belt and Road Initiative, um, is there something that we need to be concerned about in that fr formulation? I think in Southeast Asia, this is, already, this is already reality. I mean, you just walk around even the streets of Singapore or visit any of the nations in the region and China's economic presence, China's economic involvement in infrastructure projects, we're right in the thick of it. I think there's a, there's a danger that we think of Belt and Road as something that is about to happen. Uh, we're, already, we're already deeply immersed in it. Um, and it's central to what the global economy is going to look like in the future. And that's going to look very Chinese. And for some countries, that is more threatening than for others who see it as as a partnership and with mutual benefits and But is, is it threatening simply that... because China is the great big 800-pound uh, gorilla in this, organiz in, this, in this whole setup, or is it because there is somehow something darker to be worried no, about? No, I don't think there is some secret malign influence at work here. I don't think there's a, a secret BRI headquarters that we know nothing about where evil things are pl plotted to be wrought upon the world. I think that's, that's obviously not true. Um, it, it, it's about whether people are ready for the new reality. And the new reality is that, that China is, a, is an absolute global player. Uh, you see it in the way that people have responded to the kind of shifts in foreign policy from the United States and the fact that China has, to a large extent, quite willingly uh, stepped in. But this is going to change China as well. It's not right to think of China as a sort of monolithic, unchanging power. China's involvement in some cases in a very significant way in the economies of individual nations will challenge China's traditional view of itself as a non-interfering power, the, the, the Chinese pact, you know, we won't interfere with you and you certainly won't interfere with us. I'd like to come on to that in that a second. Will, that, will, that will be challenged by but this. And just the point you made there that it's obviously not true that there is some darker intent to China's Belt and Road Initiative. James, do you agree with that? Because there is an awful lot of, of commentary in Western newspapers, at least, uh, and certainly from Western officials, that would suggest that they are fearful that this is some attempt by China to infiltrate global institutions and remake them for China's benefit. I'm not sure I see that as a darker impulse. I think that's exactly what China is trying to do. China is trying to project its growing power around this region and around the world, and it's doing that for various reasons. It wants to uh, export bits of its economy that it's not using, it wants to secure natural resources, and it wants to have a much greater say in different parts of the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, where the United States has for a long time been the dominant power. So I, I don't but think... But none, none of those things are necessarily nefarious or, no, I didn't, or, or I mean, even unethical? No, no, I don't think they're really nefarious at all, but I don't think it's a great secret that this is what the Belt and Road Initiative is about. It's not simply a connection of interesting infrastructure projects. This is a geopolitical game um, that is about the projection of Chinese power. And I think the point that Richard was making um, is that countries who get involved in this have to realize what's coming down the tracks, which is a world in which China is a much more important player globally, but also in your backyard as well. One of the other things that, that is outside of the infrastructure uh, that James mentioned is education and people, what they call people-to-people -people engagement. So at last year's Belt and Road Conference, Xi Jinping made a special point mm -hmm. uh, of putting that at the heart of uh, one of their major concerns. And they're spending an awful lot of time trying to build that side of things up, aren't they? Belt and Road fits, in my opinion, in a much larger picture of what uh, China is trying to achieve. Uh, you have Belt and Road as a major infrastructure development uh, initiative. You have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. You have the uh, new Silk Road uh, f um, and that fund. Uh, but you also have a very clear strategy about um, a plan for education uh, along uh, the, the Silk Road. Uh, there are many different initiatives uh, to um, actually standardize actually almost the accreditation of degrees, uh, mutual recognition of degrees, development of new universities sponsored by Chinese universities, development of uh, educational uh, uh, programs about how to run uh, educational institutions. There's a whole, as you say, people-to-people -people, uh, element to it. And for me, it's really China 
You could actually add to that even China's major involve, involvement in the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, where they really took leadership. What you see is that China, after having been uh, not booted out, but uh, reduced in, it, in, in influence in the uh, international institutions, never gotten the fair share in the international institutions, that they're basically building up their own international institutions. Uh, and actually, I think that's a good idea, because probably some of our international institutions, like the IMF or the World Bank, were a bit stuffy and a bit uh, too much dominated by the traditional powers, powers, and there is a need for building up new international institutions. It offers uh, opportunities. The point I also want to make is beyond the fact that China is building up these inter international institutions is that ASEAN, actually ASEAN versus Belt Road Initiative doesn't exist. Uh, China is working with individual countries. But we shouldn't overestimate uh, the importance of Southeast Asia in the whole Belt and Road Initiative. You were talking about uh, the uh, southern road, basically, uh, via the Straits of Malacca. But we're actually looking at alternatives, as you say, via uh, the Arctic Circle or actually via other places like the Sunda Lombok uh, uh, Road and maybe we'll pass by the, uh, the, the Straits of Malacca Road. Well, we shouldn't overestimate the importance of Southeast Asia in the overall plan. Should it be individual country-to-country -country negotiation that dominates, or should ASEAN, as we said in our top question, be thinking about taking a greater role as an organization itself? Let's think about that, and we'll come back to that question and take questions from our audience after this short break. Do stay with us. And welcome back to Perspectives. We're talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. In particular, before the break, we were mentioning the conjunction with ASEAN. Um, Richard, let me begin with you. What do you think about the way that these conversations are being handled uh, by China and whether ASEAN as an institution needs to be thinking about coordinated approach or whether the individual country approach uh, is the rational one? I think it's really hard to resist the sort of bilateral nature of this. Uh, there is, to a certain extent, competition. China's resources are vast, but they're not infinite. And individual countries within ASEAN want to get the best possible deal for China, and they want to make Malaysia more attractive than Indonesia or Thailand more attractive than Cambodia, whatever, whatever it may be. So there may be some role for ASEAN in all of this, but China, as the BRI, expands globally. Its resources are spread more thinly. It is getting ever more ambitious by the day, and I think individual countries will be looking to put the best possible terms on the table they can and won't want that necessarily diluted through a kind of multilateral ASEAN approach. But, James, the whole point of ASEAN is, you know, with the, the economic community came into being with the understanding that the, uh, the, the whole is better served by the parts coming together. The idea that China is the big gorilla in the room um, would surely be better countered by the rest of them getting together and saying, look, we realize that the infrastructure that we're building has got to be region-wide, not intra-country. I mean, I think in theory that sounds brilliant, but it's not going to happen. Um, over the last couple of years that BRI has been on the table, ASEAN has become more divided, not less, um, as some of its members are more enthusiastic about, uh, about Chinese investment than others. And for some, particularly here in Singapore, that have traditionally had quite a close relationship with America, then they've been uh, put in a difficult position. What you will hear ASEAN itself and the countries in ASEAN say is that nobody wants to choose between America and China, but to some degree you have to. And that means that there are divisions that China's greater role in the region is creating. And so the idea that ASEAN is going to unite with one voice and negotiate with China amongst itself, I just don't think is very realistic. What about outside of ASEAN too? I mean, the, the, the bilateral situation and the competition situation in the financial sector is very interesting. You're a, a former banker. Uh, how is that financial side of things going to work out, do you think? 33% well, of all outward BRI investments are being channelized via Singapore. So we, we have obviously made our 
ourselves useful to China in terms of the BRI approach. And a lot of funding is being channeled from Singapore. A lot of Chinese banks have set up agreements with Singapore government agencies to, to build their sort of BRI teams from Singapore. So I think vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong, there are certain advantages. Singapore has a very good framework of tax treaties with many, many countries. We have a lot of FTAs with many, many countries and regions. So I think Singapore's importance as a financial services hub is very important. At the same time, a lot of investments, for example, AIIB, um, although you know it has now been in operation for about three years, a lot of the projects that they're investing in is actually jointly with other uh, banks, multi MDBs, multilateral banks, and local banks. So I think Singapore as a global financial services hub has a huge role to play as far as BRI is concerned. Another. I'm far less optimistic than that. Um, you have to look at reality. If you look at simple markets, South Asia is much more important than uh, Southeast Asia. If you look at security agreements, Russia is much more important than Southeast Asia. If you look at uh, political um, uh, agreements, uh, again, Kazakhstan, Central Asia is probably more important to China. We should not overestimate the importance of Southeast Asia. And I say that not with pleasure. I say that simply because we, I think we will work, have to work hard to be part of the BRI uh, momentum. We will have to try to be very competitive. There are probably two countries here in Southeast Asia that have an advantage. That is Thailand and Malaysia, uh, because they have some assets, access to seas um, for Thailand via Laos and uh, uh, access to, for China to the, to the southern seas and, and oceans. Uh, but the other countries have actually fairly limited uh, competitive advantage compared to some other countries on the BRI. Uh, so um, while I'm happy to hear that a lot of, and I agree with you, that a lot of the uh, financing goes through Singapore, uh, we, work, we have to do that because or we can do that because we are competitive and we have to be very competitive in this game. So my message is let's not look at BRI as this big, big um, present that comes from the north and we only have to uh, benefit from all these uh, uh, of, of all this largesse that china is going to have we'll have to work very hard to be part of the bri or the bri will pass us by as far as southeast asia one advantage we do have is ease of doing business in southeast asia the big markets you mentioned malaysia thailand indonesia vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries that are covered within the BRI. Ease of doing business, the level of transparency, the level of comfort. Chinese companies have operated here even before the existence mm. of BRI. I think those factors give ASEAN some head start. But you're right, Professor Arno, we need to make sure we keep up the competitive advantage because 65 countries covers, the Belt and Road covers 65% of humanity. All right, let's take to the audience and uh, get some questions from the floor. Good evening, and my name is Shankari. Um, as the BRI continues to gain momentum, do you think that the USA should respond? And if you think they should, how do you think they should respond without making ASEAN shoe sites? Thank you. Well, it's a very interesting question. I mean, the US foreign policy is elsewhere at the moment and very hard to discern what is a priority. Excuse me, where is it? But it, it's, it's elsewhere uh, to, to be defined. Um, it, it, it's an extraordinary time that we are that we are we are living through, um, and it is an opportune time, of course, for China to step in to this role on the world stage. And happy coincidence, I think, that in Xi Jinping they've got somebody at the helm in China who is kind of ready and enthusiastic to do that. That hasn't always been the case in China, but there's a sort of neat coincidence. Um, we could debate American foreign policy all day long. But we, um, could also, we could also debate leadership. I mean, Xi Jinping is going to be there for a while. Um, Trump's future is not quite so certain. Would it yeah. make a difference? Or, or is it, it, it would make a difference, and I think it's wrong also to define this just about, uh, just about Trump. American foreign policy had started to shift quite fundamentally under the previous, under President, President Obama. We can, you know, American fatigue with its 9-11 wars, U.S. self-sufficiency in hydrocarbons, there's some big changes going on mm -hmm. in the kind of fundamentals that shape U.S. foreign policy. President Trump has given a very particular voice uh, to that shift, but it's wrong to just fixate on him and the kind of daily, weekly 
um, shifts and changes right. in U.S. policy. Um, let, let's, let's take it to the ultimate uh, scenario, James. I mean, we're already seeing a trade war breaking out. Um, how far can that go? Well, I think the trade war can get quite a lot worse than it not is just, at the moment. Not just the trade war, I mean that relationship. And I think the relations between America and China can get a lot worse than they are at the moment. But to the, the question that was asked, I think what's interesting about this is it's no longer just about what America will do. Mm. Um, this has become, uh, as the U.S. has begun to retreat, you have to begin to look at what the Japanese and the Indians and the Australians in particular, they're the ones who are coordinating as a potential counterbalance to China, but a lot of other countries in the region as well. We mentioned Russia. So what you have is a much more complicated picture um, in which a bunch of other countries are going to try and coordinate to balance China. And that is what we're, we're watching to see if that is going to be effective. I think it's going to be very difficult to do that because they then are divided amongst themselves. But that, I think, is what's going to happen more than the idea of America itself being the leader. But BRI is not the only uh, um program around. I mean, the Japanese have actually this uh, quality uh, infrastructure investment project. The Koreans have this Euro-Asia infrastructure investment project. Uh, the Indians have the Look East policy. Uh, they may not have all the resources uh, to implement these things, but for me, if you're sitting here in Southeast Asia, I think you should look at a por portfolio of opportunities, not at, not be fixated on this uh, BRI thing, but uh, look at the portfolio of opportunities that exist for investment in infrastructure because we badly need the investment in infrastructure. The invest infrastructure on land is perhaps improving a lot, but the connections okay. between the different nations over the seas, the ports, we, as you mentioned earlier on, there are billions, hundreds of billions of dollars needed. And I think that BRI, with all respect to the Chinese, cannot do everything. Let's take another question. Uh, hi, Steve Tunstall. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, an insurtech built on the blockchain. When I travel, and I travel a lot through Africa, I see the impact of BRI down there as well. And this may be a little bit cynical, but I see the same sort of things in most countries. I see the parliament buildings, I see the football stadiums, I see the airports all built by the, uh, by the Chinese contractors. So you get an element of something for the ruling classes, something for the, for the masses, and something to get the stuff out that we really want. In certain parts of Asia, this is already playing out as, a, as, as something of a problem. I mean, if we look at what's happening in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh to some extent, perhaps we can see five years, ten years down the road, there's going to be some real issues with how these projects are funded, who ends up finally owning these things. Um, maybe we should be careful what we wish for, for some of the more weakly governed countries in ASEAN, that they could end up in the same sort of situation. Um, how does the panel see this playing out in five or ten years? We'll touch that question when we come back, because we're going to have to take a short, short break. Do stay with us. We're back in a couple of minutes. And welcome back to Perspectives. Before the break, we had a question from the audience about the role of debt and the financing of projects by China in places like Africa and Sri Lanka uh, and whether this might lead to the possibility uh, of the use of debt as an instrument of control. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, these are, these are well documented. The problems that have Chinese investment has encountered with airports and ports in Sri Lanka, uh, dams in Myanmar that have been postponed or cancelled, and a long litany of projects further afield in Africa. To be frank, there's a kind of schadenfreude that exists about this. Of course this is difficult. Of course this is problematic. Of course we're going to run into problems. You can't build something in somebody else's back garden and expect to remain friends indefinitely. I mean, there's, a, there's inherent complexity involved in doing business on this scale. And I'm sure mistakes have been made. We have to look at this over the proposed multi-decade sort of scope of what BRI is all about. And it will go through multiple iterations. So you're saying that Africa and Sri Lanka and uh, other projects like this might actually be better off, even if there is that danger, than they would be if they didn't exist? Yeah, I mean, the, is, is the, that... the infrastructure deficit hasn't gone away in right. any of these countries. There are other alternatives around, such as Japan and Korea and the World Bank, but nobody else on the scale that, that, that China is able to deliver. 
So if the first round has been, in some cases, somewhat satisfactory, I don't think we should necessarily see that as a blueprint mm. of failure forever. James? I think that's right. I think it's a very good question. There is a big debt uh, risk. The real problem, though, is not so much in the things that get built on land. It's the things that get built on the sea. So it's the things that can be converted to military use. That was the issue in Sri Lanka. It wasn't so much that other countries like India and America were worried about the port in southern Sri Lanka simply going bust. They were worried that when the Chinese came in and took most of it over, that it would get converted into a military port. And so particularly for the portion of BRI which is built um, in the ocean or which is serving a maritime power, that becomes much more complicated. But I think you're right. Debt is a big problem and it's something that countries have to go into with their eyes open. No, I just wanted to add to that. Yes, some of the investments are trophy investments. Uh, they are um, parliament buildings or um, white elephant airports or something like that. But the reality is when you go to these countries in Africa or you go to Sri Lanka, you suddenly discover a lot better road network telecommunication works. So in other words, there is a lot more than simply some of these trophy investments. I think, you know, a lot of these projects are being funded through debt and, and, and clearly uh, for some countries the debt levels are, are rising uh, precipitously. However, I think some of these projects need to be looked at in terms of the bankability of the project. I think countries need to make an effort to identify and prioritize projects which have a bigger impact on the economic future generation of the uh, growth potential, but also those which can generate a better rate of return. And on those projects, governments have a choice to structure those projects instead of a loan to a PPP or 3P model, whereby you get private capital uh, and, and investors from local countries. Other countries can come, co-invest with the Chinese, and this takes care of the debt problem also. And also f gets the countries to focus on projects which are perhaps more viable. And, and then, of course, you can build the social infrastructure, but prioritize those highways, those airports that can generate a real return for the society and economically. Fantastic. The second other question. So. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Jordan, I'm from Victoria Junior College. Um, how can ASEAN actually uh, position itself to become more competitive and more relevant in the face of uh, the BRI? Okay. I, I don't think that we have particularly uh, a particular advantage vis-à-vis uh, -vis Central Asia, South Asia, Russia, uh, and other places uh, that are on the BRI, on b both belt and road and, and belt. So it, it all comes down to being a lot more competitive than some of these other countries. Uh, we, we referred already earlier on that uh, perhaps the investment uh, climate is better in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, perhaps uh, the efficiency in which some of the companies can deliver some of the projects may be higher. But the point I really wanted to make is we're not going to get it because we're good friends with China. We are going to get it if we are more efficient in building some of that infrastructure, in, in delivering these projects faster uh, with higher quality. I think one advantage we do have is the quality of human resources. In ASEAN, generally the level, and I'm speaking here to an audience from SMU as well, uh, the quality of education, human resources across Southeast Asia is pretty good. We have the advantage of having large Mandarin-speaking populations as well as those who can speak very good English. So I think we can leverage our human resources, not just in ASEAN, but beyond to regions like South Asia, Central Asia, and, and Africa, and, and really bring our expertise, our human resources to the fore. Hmm. Let's take another question. How feasible are ASEAN projects given the differing vested interests involved? So for instance, my example would be the SG Kunming Railway. It seems economically unfeasible for countries such as Laos to partake in the due to its lack of domestic traffic, and 23% of its population is under the national poverty line. Hence, they are unable to afford the high-speed railway fees. I mean, I think the, it's a great question. The, the railway in Laos is one of the clearest examples of, in effect, free Chinese money. Um, this is not an economic project. This is being done to win friends in the region. But not all of the projects are like that. In fact, most of them aren't like that. Most of the projects are given at commercial loan rates, um, are much more expensive, and therefore the risk is, is quite different. Um, so I think most of the projects are not like the one that you see in Laos. Certainly, for instance, the, the project, the rail project linking Singapore to Kuala Lumpur is not going to be uh, structured in the same way as that. So. But the project in itself as a standalone entity may be an example of free Chinese money, but isn't there the, you know, the hope that emergent effects will lead to, to greater benefits at the end of the day? 
Well, I don't think so. Well, in Laos, as the questioner said, you have a tiny population. It's quite poor. The <laughs> idea that this railway is going to create some tourism boom, which I think is the official justification, seems pretty pie in the sky to me. In the end, this is not a project that is either economically viable on its own terms or given the country that it's going through that's going to create a huge inward investment boom. I think if you look at some of the other BRI projects, then they, you can make that, that, that case that um, if you begin to have much better rail infrastructure between Singapore and Malaysia, then the, the economic benefits of that could be very considerable. But that's just to say that there are lots of different kinds of projects within the BRI basket, and they're not all the same. Mm. One of the risks that I see in the BRI is that, in the end, it serves China, and, and that's fair. Uh, why would uh, China come up with this great project if it would not serve its own it interests? Uh, but then when you look at these corridors that China is trying to develop, the, the BRI corridors, uh, it's really to link China to bigger markets. They may well go through Laos, but whether it ever will have big benefits for Laos is a different question. And that is the risk of some of these investment projects, in my opinion, not only the debt uh, burden that it is created and that you were referring to before, but that there sometimes may be a big tension between the um, grand view of what BRI tries to achieve, linking China to faraway markets, and the impact on the environmental impact, the little economic impact, a limited in economic impact on local communities. I mean, and that may well be a big risk. I mean, it's worth pointing out that in many of these countries, not just in, in Laos, in Indonesia in, in particular, these Chinese projects are very unpopular. So although one might view them as, to some degree, free money, local people see them as being built by Chinese companies, constructed by Chinese workers, with very little benefit for local populations. So although on the one hand China is being quite generous, it's not getting any particular benefit um, in terms of public relations in the local population. To, to, to my, from my perspective, I think BRI is a massive project uh, initiative. Many projects have to be commercially viable, and certainly they're charged at, at market rates. But there are certain projects which have a strategic value, strategic value for the host country as well as for China. I can think of one more example, which is in Pakistan, the Gwadar port on the mm. Arabian Sea. Uh, clearly, it's not going to be very marketable and commercially viable in the short run, but longer term, it has a lot of geopolitical, geostrategic advantages, both for Pakistan and for China. All right. Let's take a question at the back. Uh, if <clears throat> Hi. My name is Stephanie Krishnan. I'm from Get Go Global. We're a digital supply chain company. Um, the question I have, one of the points or two of the points that have been raised is that we shouldn't be making a choice between, say, the US and China, um, but also that there are security concerns. Um, Australia, the US, India and Japan have you know, mooted a conversation about having an alternative to the BRI. Is there scope for that in the region? And given ASEAN's position, could we end up being in a turf war? It's attractive on paper. I think the reality is going to be to be way more difficult. Um, Japan has its own very sharp agenda here. Um, the whole rise of China, the BRI initiative, has really sharpened Japan's sense of its own rivalry with China. Japan, of course, wants to kind of have some friends on its side in that, uh, in that debate, as it were, but really it's going to be about Japan's ability to compete project by project with China. Uh, Australia is always looking for sort of ballast in its relationship uh, with China, something to counterbalance its relationship with China. Uh, India is kind of preoccupied, I think, with other things, of course has a historically difficult relationship with China and at the moment isn't a significant destination uh, for BRI projects. But I think that quad that you've been talking about um, obfuscates the very specific impact that this is having on Japan. I think ultimately it's a really good thing for Japan and I think Prime Minister Abe realises that. Um, Japanese business is extremely impressive when you see it at close quarters, the way it's coordinated and synchronised with Japan's aid programme, the way it's synchronised with Japan's foreign policy objectives the way that Japan doesn't do what China has done in some of the projects that we've mentioned. It's not in the business of exporting labor. It's not in the business of kind of getting rid of things out of its economy that it, it no longer needs in the way that the early, early iterations of BRI have been. So Japan has some very strong cards to play. It also has 
the capital base to be a serious contender to compete with, uh, with Chinese projects in different parts of the world. All right, we're going to have to pause there for a moment and take another short break, but we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Do stay with us. And welcome back to Perspectives. Before the break, we had a question from the audience about the so-called Quad initiative. Is it an initiative? Is it a real thing? And uh, let me add on to the question, is it actually productive or is it supposed to be a blocking move? I think it's the beginnings of a real thing. I think uh, some of the countries involved have been keener to do this than others, and it shows that the laggards like, uh, like India have been now become sufficiently alarmed by China that they have decided to sign up to this uh, for power agreement. I think how this develops, a lot of it now depends on China. If China is very aggressive, for instance, if it continues its island building program in the South China Sea, or it makes other um, more aggressive moves, then it will get a reaction from the other, uh, the other powers. Um, if it doesn't, if China plays this fairly softly, softly, and, and plays nicely with others, then I think you'll find that the, the, the quad countries, uh, India, Japan, America, and Australia, aren't going to make much of the running on their own. And certainly, as Richard said, I don't think it's very likely that they're going to come up with some massive, well-funded pot of money that will be a, a rival, an alternative to BRI. And so in that sense, I I think it's quite unlikely, at least in the near term, that ASEAN is going to have to choose. Let's take another question. Hi, uh, my name is Samuel. I'm a student from Singapore Management University. Um, China has been developing um, quite significantly in Malaysia and um, Thailand through the East Coast Rail Link, through the Kuantan Port and also the Kra Canal to bypass the Straits of Malacca, which is also Singapore's greatest competitive advantage. So my question for the panel is, how should Singapore take part in these um, in this projects? Should we actually um, take on the ASEAN development role as we attempt to develop ASEAN or should we take a more defensive stance in protecting our own businesses back in Singapore? First of all, um, the, the belt uh, passing by Singapore is still a real one. Uh, there is not a good alternative for the Straits of Malacca, and Singapore remains a very strong uh, port. Uh, there are alternatives. We talked about the Arctic Circle. We talked about the Sunda uh, Lombok uh, uh, connection. But there are no real ports over there. So we are still in a situation that probably for the next 25 years, we're in a fairly safe situation uh, that Singapore is on that belt and a competitive uh, port on that belt. It's interesting when you look some of, at some of the maps that are published by the Ministry of Trade and Industry in China, that Singapore doesn't appear on the maps of the Belt and Roads. Uh, but usually it's the ports that they control or in which they have huge investments that are on these maps. Uh, so we, again, we will have to work hard to remain on that map. But I would say that Singapore can play a very strong role uh, in the soft aspects of the uh, Belt Road initiatives. The financing was already mentioned. Um, international project uh, management um, is, uh, there is a big need for good international project financing and international project management. Insurance, uh, uh, there are enormous risks involved in the Belt Road initiatives and uh, there is need for risk analysis but also for strong insurance and I believe that Again, Singapore is quite well paid, placed to offer these services. So the, the, the higher value um, contributions yeah. you're talking about, as well as the engineering expertise and... and Absolutely. Singapore's got a fantastic brand name, uh, not just in China, but all over the world. And I think that's r the real value that we have. If we can partner and work with the Chinese companies uh, to execute some of these projects, I think this also brings a, a higher level of comfort uh, to those countries. I've visited Africa. We talked about Africa earlier on. And, and, and it's amazing. You know, the Singapore brand name is, 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 is very well respected. So I think there are opportunities for us to work on the Belt and Road, not just within the ASEAN region, but beyond that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, everywhere I go in the world, whether it's Rwanda, Panama, Cape Town, everybody's trying to say we're the next Singapore, we're the Singapore of Southern Africa, we're the Singapore of Central America, we're the Singapore of Central Africa. People have never even been to Singapore and modelling themselves on <laughs> Singapore. So I think we're a way off Singapore losing that inherent competitive advantage. That the it little has. red dot brand is getting bigger and bigger. Another question, sir? I'm Jeffrey. I'm from Human Capital Singapore. And um, we heard that BRI is complex, it's complicated, and we have to work hard to benefit from it. 
But the question is, how do we in Singapore, especially business leaders and the workforce, and maybe the young ones, prepare ourselves? And even what skills and knowledge become very critical? Thank you. Most of the countries on Belt and Road are not necessarily glamorous cities like Tokyo, Los Angeles, Paris or London, but they're uh, quite difficult places to operate in. Um, I mean, Kazakhstan is not... I hope nobody is here from Kazakhstan, but <laughs> it's perhaps not the easiest country in the world to work. Uh, um, and there are, I could m mention many more like that on the Belt Road. Uh, we probably need to develop the resilience and the endurance to work in these countries. And hopefully uh, through programs like we have at SMU where we have uh, overseas exposure for our students, we will be able to develop that resilience, the ability to work in not so perfect circumstances, not in that wonderful infrastructure bubble in, in, the, in which we live here in Singapore. Professor Arnold, if I can uh, share the news with you, we are setting up an office in Kazakhstan, <laughs> and I'm very pleased to it's say... It's the Singapore of Central Asia. It, it, it is, actually. It's quite I mean, a fairly developed place. Um, the weather is extreme, um, as, as we would expect, um, but quite developed, and I'm very proud to say that we have a Singaporean who is going to be stationed Good. in Astana. Um, so, and, and I think, but Professor Arnold, I think, has hit it on, on the head. Uh, Singapore is a small country. Uh, we need to take advantage of the opportunities overseas and increasingly these opportunities are going to be beyond three to six hours flying radius and young Singaporeans need to be prepared to travel and mobilize uh, themselves with their families or, or by themselves uh, to these locations because that's really where the opportunity is and if we want to cash in on our brand name on our expertise then we've got to be prepared to travel and we talked about Japan and other countries I think one of the disadvantages some of these countries have is that it's not easy for them to take people across to other countries. If we can make that our strength, then I think we have a huge role to play. If you go further, please recruit a few more SMU graduates. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's begin to, to bring the conversation back towards where we began and, and the role of ASEAN in all of this. We're talking about individual bilateral communications between the ASEAN members and China as the way forward rather than an ASEAN-led kind of initiative. And I have to wonder whether the implication of that might be um, a dis dissolution of ASEAN in the long term? No, I don't think so. I think ASEAN is just going to have to cope with the fact that the new geopolitical reality in which you have both America and China and then India and then Japan is complicated and is going to sow divisions amongst its members who each have their own self-interest. So ASEAN has always been a consensus-based organization. It's going to be harder to get consensus. And so ASEAN in many ways I think will, will move more slowly and so the idea that ASEAN is going Move to take more a, slowly. Yeah, will take a central, the idea that ASEAN even more slowly, uh, that ASEAN will take a central role in something like this, I think is just quite unlikely. Is, I mean, there's going to be a change in local dynamics between the member nations, isn't there, as a consequence of Belt and Road? Absolutely, yeah. Um, that's, that's happening anyway. Belt and Road doesn't make that happen. China makes that happen. Um, I think there is a a really important advantage that this part of the world does have, and that's probably an ability to kind of tune in more, more readily to how Chinese organizations make decisions. So much of sort of business education is still geared around the kind of U.S. model. We've worked with Chinese organizations now for about 12 years. You have to learn new skills. You have to learn new lessons. Not everything that you have applied everywhere else in your business works well in China. I think there is something about Singapore, this part of the world, that makes it more easy. This is a slightly ab abstract point or conceptual point, but I think played well the capabilities that Singapore and the region and ASEAN have to be able to sort of chime and tune with China more readily than South America or Africa or, or Central Asia that, that shouldn't be underestimated in all of this. All right. Well, having, having said those things, uh, very quickly, Anna. I'm just going to say um, I'm a very big supporter from ASEAN. We need it for the economic environment here. But when we are sitting here 25 years from now, we still will say that ASEAN needs to have better decision mechanisms. All right. Well, let, let me now invite then the audience to return to the question we began the show with. How can ASEAN make sure that it derives optimum outcomes from the Belt and Road Initiative? I wonder if any of you have changed your mind as a consequence of the conversation. While you're doing your voting on your clickers, let's take one final quick question from the floor. 
My name is Cheryl. I'm from Singapore Institute of Management. My country is towards the trophy projects because a lot of funds are actually put into trophy projects which could have been used for other projects that are more profitable or infrastructure that will actually be value-adding to the country. So does the panel feel that this trophy project, the fund that is directed to trophy projects should have been used for other kind of projects? Thank you. Very quick response. I'm afraid it comes with the territory. It's, this is not unique to China's international investment. Trophy projects in countries with fragile political systems, often with a, a lack of democratic checks and balances on the investment process, are, I'm afraid, an inevitable and regrettable side effect of large sums of money being spent in some of these countries. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should blame the Chinese for this either. I mean, they're coming in and saying, what do you want? And people say, well, we want a football stadium or a presidential palace. So... Um, this is, tends to be the fault of the recipient countries, not the, not the Chinese. If I, if I could just add, I mean, I know trophy projects gets a lot of airtime, but if you look at the Belt and Road analytically, a lot of the projects, in fact, 80% of the projects are going towards power, transportation, and telecoms. Yeah. By and large, those categories of infrastructure, classes of infrastructure are actually required in those countries. Now, I think the question is selectivity of the projects. Do you need to do it in region A or region B? Does it become a coal-fired or renewable? I think those are the questions that need to be answered, not just by China, but also by those countries and by those societies. All right, very, very quickly. As I just said, um, trophy projects sometimes are have a symbolic value also uh, about collaboration between countries. But in the end, at the same time, telecommunications works. Yeah. Roads are there. Ports are working. And that's probably also important to the countries. And I will end with a very final, very quick question. You know, we sit here and have these panels and we talk about this stuff and everyone's aware of it. But the coverage seems still, from the journalistic perspective, very narrow. We talk about changing geopolitical interrelationships between countries. Isn't it time the world paid more attention? I think that will happen over time. The coverage that Belt and Road itself gets is very substantial, and I think that this, this is really the first Asian project that has captured world attention in this way, and it'll be the first of many. All right, let's end off with uh, a look at our program question. How can ASEAN make sure it derives optimum outcomes from Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, and we've had a, a slight movement insofar as more people now think that there needs to be more centralized control of ASEAN decision making. <laughs> so the idea that it's going to be a bilateral issue going forward is not necessarily an attractive one to our audience. But that's where we'll have to leave it. Audience, please thank our panel today, if you would. And thank you also for your questions and your engagement on the program. It's been great having you along. This is the end of this particular series in conjunction with SMU. Thank you to SMU uh, for being our hosts on this. You can comment on the series at our website. You can tweet us at CNA Perspectives. In the next series of Perspectives, we're going to shift the focus to healthcare and explore the world of infectious diseases. I'm sure you'll look forward to that. Until then, thanks for being with us on this series. I'm Taimon Nabili. Bye-bye. This program was brought to you by Singapore Management University.